This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. This podcast is sponsored by The Forward. Stay up to date with unlimited access to news, culture, and opinion all through a Jewish lens. And for our listeners, for 2NJB listeners, get six months of The Forward for 15 bucks. An exclusive subscription offer for our listeners, forward.com slash 2NJB, and get six months for 15 bucks. Also in collaboration with Arutz Sheva, IsraelNationalNews.com. And last but not least, in collaboration with Australian Jewish News, check them out at ajn.timesofisrael.com. What would you do if you woke up one day and you were told that you're going to be given $2.5 million? No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Just take the money and make something good out of it. Unfortunately, us simpletons seldomly face these kinds of problems. But today's guest was recently put to this very test. Professor Oded Rechavi is one of the youngest, most promising scientists in the Israeli academia today. He's a professor of neurobiology and genetics in Tel Aviv University, where he researches various subjects from diseases to irrationality, and even ancient scrolls. Professor Rachavi is a laureate of many awards, including the Blavetnik Award, the Schmidt Award, and the Polymath Award, which recently granted him $2.5 million, along with one goal. Make something interesting out of it, whatever you see fit. So we are extremely excited, honored, thrilled to have Professor Rachavi on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you? Hi. Thank you. Before we start, we have a sponsor. Yes, we do. I did not forget. Okay. I definitely did not forget. <laughs> it's Masa Israel. I put you to a test. Yeah. Yeah, but no, guys, really, Masa Israel Journey. Okay. You have to check them out. Uh, this is Why? Like, this is personal for me because I was on a Masa program. Mm. Um, and it, they really are an amazing, amazing uh, organization. They bring uh, young aspiring, ambitious. ambitious Jews to Israel and various kinds of programs. And this one is just absolutely amazing. So if you're listening, you probably have some kind of interest in Israel. Masai Israel Journey is the marketplace for long-term opportunities in Israel. You can explore your career path, live out your passions, and you can make a positive impact on the world. During the pandemic, okay, they actually also created options to study and work remotely from Israel. So you need to be in Israel. Here but, there is no pandemic, but... Yeah. But you can actually come here and study and work remotely. And you don't need to pause your life or no Hebrew to join. You do get funding. So join, learn more at MasaIsrael.org slash Two Nice Jewish Boys, T-W-O, Nice Jewish Boys. MasaIsrael.org slash Two Nice Jewish Boys. Check them out. Okay. So after taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I haven't dealt with the taxes yet. <laughs> oh, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the university does that so uh, ah, okay yeah okay so it goes through the university yeah of course it, everything goes every, it's not personal money that i get into my bank account ah. everything goes through the university and that's the true with every award or grant or, oh, I, see. Um, I see but the nice thing about this particular award is that uh they don't limit you they let you do whatever you want with the only restriction that it has to be something new that you didn't do before but which is also unusual it's very rare, right? Yes, this kind is. of grants. It's very rare because normally uh, you get money for what you already did. And also your chances of getting more awards, more grants increase if you just do the same thing over and over because you carve yourself a niche in the scientific community and uh, then it gets easier. Here they, they want, to, they want to, to challenge you and make you do new things. Uh, so and also to sponsor things that are not normally sponsored. So crazier stuff. So, okay, I got two questions. One, if it's going through the university, are they taking out a big cut tax-wise? And the serious question, like how much of the 2.5 is left? Mm -hmm. And two, what is 2.5 in terms of a scientist and in terms of your field specifically? specifically, Like what can you do with that money? Yeah, so the university does take a cut. It's a small cut relatively. Uh, And uh, most of it is left 
uh, to the lab and uh, it's it's a lot of money 2.5 millions uh, um, I, I say it's it's probably a third of my of my lab's budget something like that wow. Year, yearly, yearly. Uh, uh, no so it's uh, oh, it, so that's another thing normally grants in academia are short term so you get them the money for one year three years five at most this is a five year award uh, and they're probably very flexible in how you spend it as long as you get the, the job done uh, but you get uh, five hundred dollars uh, for each year for five years and five hundred uh, thousand thousand dollars for yeah. each year five years but you're saying it's a third of your lab's o overall, uh, budget. overall budget for what for that, five years that we currently have that we currently ah. have in the the bank the university bank mm -hmm. for for the lab so it's a very substantial award the other money is tied to other projects here it's very free which is so it's also uh, hard to start completely new new topics if if you don't have the dedicated uh uh, funding here they, they want you to do new th new things so why did they give you of all the professor why you yeah so they gave it to uh to me and they gave it to uh, jeff go for mit this is the first two laureates and they want to give more and more in uh, future years this was the the, the first time they, they did it and they did it uh they, they got to know me because of the dead sea scrolls project that we did okay that i can uh, tell yes. you about uh, which uh, they sponsored. And this mm. is how they got to know me and they saw that we do unusual things in the lab that other people, other labs don't. Uh, and also that we succeeded in a very difficult project that was very out of the box. So what we did, normally what we study in the lab, we study different topics, as you said, but our main topic is epigenetic inheritance. I can also elaborate about that glad, gladly. But epigenetic inheritance is inheritance that doesn't go through changes in the DNA sequence and it allows also things that normal DNA based inheritance doesn't allow and the most controversial thing this is what we study is inheritance of parental responses so you do mm. something during your life and it changes the biology of the next generation which is something that can't happen just based on DNA based genetics this is Isn't the there a study around the 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 effects of Holocaust second generation and third generation there, there are all kinds of of, of uh, studies the most famous study in humans is there, there is a, also a, a, a Holocaust uh, study but the but, but that's relatively a small study mm -hmm. a big study was done was done on uh, also related to to uh, the Second World War is about the uh, the descendants of women that were starved in the Netherlands. This is called the, the Dutch famine or the hunger winter. Mm -hmm. And there they studied many, many uh, kids and grandkids of women that were starved. In the Netherlands, the, the Nazis in the end of the war, they starved for approximately half a year, a very large population. Uh, and they did a huge epidemiological study to see whether there, is, there are any effects on the descendants. And they saw that it affects their... Uh, chances to uh, get sick with diabetes and also to develop all kinds of neurological diseases such as diabetes. How can you prove that though? So they compared, what they did in this study, they compared the, the, the uh, kids that were uh, in utero, so in their mother's uteros, while uh, she was starved to their siblings that weren't. Mm. That, that was the comparison. And, and they also uh, checked their kids, so the grandkids. Mm. But it's not really, and, and they, they saw differences that seem uh, convincing. However, this is not, the, not, doesn't really necessitate any unusual genetics because when you starve the mother, the baby that's inside her is directly exposed to the environment. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's not something weird. Not only that, since this kid also already has a germ cells, sperm or oocyte, you in fact expose also the grandchildren to the environment. Mm. Only if it lasts for an additional generation, it's a true epige epigenetic effect that doesn't go through changes to the DNA because the DNA doesn't change in response to the environment. It can't be directed. The mutations and so cannot be directed by the environment. What we did, we studied it in, in very simple organisms, which is always what we do. We used nematodes, small worms that are microscopic, but they are very powerful for studies of inheritance. I thought you were going to say people from uh, Ashkelon. <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. that's uh, <laughs> that's or really from Birmingham. Yeah. I don't. I, I picked the city where I know the least amount of people. It's <laughs> <laughs> harder to control. Yeah. But, but with with nematodes, it's simple. You control what they eat, 
and they are genetically identical almost to one another and they make hundreds of babies very fast. So a generation passes after three days. So you can actually study multiple generations and huge numbers, thousands of, of individuals. And we identify, we found this mechanism of inheritance that's not mediated by the DNA, but by changes in another molecule, which now everyone knows, which is RNA. Mm -hmm. So now, of course, with the vaccines, everybody know about mRNA. This is not mRNA, it's another type of RNA which is smaller, these are called small RNAs, and these are inherited, it turns out, in addition to the DNA, in a parallel mechanism that doesn't obey the normal rules of genetics that we know that were identified over 150 years ago. So this is completely new, and it allows new things. So for these worms, it allows them to memorize the diet state of their ancestors for multiple generations. So what if you that, starve them, the diet it means that if you starve them, yeah. the next generations are more prepared for additional rounds of starvation and they live longer because they regulate transgenerationally genes that function in nutrition. They also produce transgenerational vaccination against uh, viruses. And these worms are remarkably immune to viruses. There, there isn't any virus that infects them in the wild, which is, uh, there probably is, but n n none was identified. So, um, it gives a whole new meaning to listen to your instincts because all of a sudden you, you, your instincts means just millions of years of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, we don't know. This is very important to emphasize. We don't know whether this is conserved also in humans. We don't mm -hmm. know. But, but, but it, it's probably worth thinking that it does. Why not? I mean, at least in terms of your responsibility for future generations. I would say that um, also... Normal genetics started in very simple organisms. So the rules of genetics were identified in peas, mm -hmm. later in flies and bacteria and viruses. And until they really understood, understood it, and also understood that it works through DNA, it took a long time. So here again, I think the, the worm, wow. these simple uh, nematodes are the peas of epigenetics, I hope. And I, I, I'm hopeful that it will be conserved, but we don't know yet. But just to understand, when you're speaking about epigenetics... Um, you're not talking about nature versus nurture, right? It's not that it's it's not psychological tr transmission. It is biological, just not through DNA. It is, or does it? Well, it's a complicated. Uh, you, the, the way you phrase it, it's a little complicated. Yes, at the end, it's about the effect of nature versus nurture. But the question here is w w whether nurture can affect can affect inheritance. That's the question, and and it is biological. These are natural molecules, organic molecules that mediate this inheritance. Um, the, the examples that I gave you, starvation and viruses, are, are not psychological. However, we also showed, and that's a paper we published um, a year and a half ago, uh, that if you, the changes in, the, in these small RNAs in the nervous system, in the brain of the worm, affect the capacity of the next generation to locate food, to behave. So the, the ancestors controlled the capacity of the next generations to behave. But how do you know it's not through DNA? It's not through DNA, first of all, because it peters out. It stops after a while. And plus, because we identified how it works. It works through these small RNAs. And if you stop small RNA inheritance, and we can do this inducibly, we can also uh, just work with mutants that don't have the capacity to tr transmit the RNA between generations, then the effect stops. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we can really trace down these molecules, mo uh, sequence them just like you, you uh, characterize DNA. It, it reminds me that we, we, it was discovered now that the mRNA vaccines transmit the immunity to the babies but through it, RNA. I don't know if no, it has anything no, to do It's not through RNA. So the RNA in fact of the vaccine, the mRNA that you get injected with, doesn't transfer to the baby. But there are new studies that say that maybe some of the antibodies that are made affect also the baby, at least for a while. Is, is this, I mean, I have a, a, a memory of, of a study that I heard about. Maybe you can confirm it, but I think it, it, it touches upon this, the famous one about a m mice with the cherry scent. Yeah. Is that actually an, a thing? Yeah, so, so there are studies, just like the one that you mentioned, there are a few studies in, in uh, mice uh, and other organisms. In fact, there are many examples in the literature of transgenerational responses. Mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the mechanisms are less clear. This so is that wasn't necessarily a study into epigenetics? It was, it was a study was? about epigenetic inheritance. They said that you can create this association. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly what they did, but I think they created... I think it, yeah. it, I think it was an order and some strong sounds or something like that. 
Uh, it wasn't cherry. It made, scent. I, I don't remember. From the way I remember it, just to fill in the listeners, and again, I might be, guys, search on Google because I might be misleading you, but was that they exposed one generation of mice to a scent and then trauma induced some kind of trauma, and then they saw a traumatic response in the next generation whenever right. they exposed them. There are them different to the scent. paradigms like that. Yeah. There are also paradigms of maternal separation that creates t trauma. All of this is true. Uh, um, there are many examples. But the mechanisms are unclear. They are mm -hmm. less clear. It's harder to study. A mouse only has a few children. And mice are genetically different from one another, no matter how much you try. With these worms, you can actually pinpoint the mechanism and how it works. And this is what we're doing. This is the main mm -hmm. thing that we study in the lab. So my grandmother was afraid of dogs, right? <laughs> and my mother is, has a phobia of dogs. And I have a phobia of dogs. And my mother would always say, you know, we tried so hard. I tried so hard to hit it and yet you got it I don't understand so but that could be explained by regular genetics you uh, just have the uh, uh, a change in your DNA you have a particular variation of a gene that makes you uh, be afraid of, of dogs it doesn't have to be acquired uh -huh. the difference here is that let's say I ex you, you're not afraid of dogs and I would expose you to a frightening mm. dog and as a result your kids would be afraid of a dog so you see it's right. very it's very so different meaning the environment actually changes the dna or the, not, or the not, rna or not Small the dna RNA. right so there are different mechanisms that have been proposed for epigenetic yeah. inheritance rna is the new the newest thing but there are also modifications to the dna it's a whole it's it's a big field but i think now rna is establishing itself these small rnas as the most promising mechanism for transgenerational for epigenetic genetics and and this is really something it's a it's a so it's a very exciting revolution because that what used to be something that you couldn't even say i don't know yeah. if you're aware but this there, there's this theory of lamarck versus darwin so if you want I, I'll, I'll tell you this was a dirty word you couldn't say it to biologists the worst the worst thing that you could say to a biologist that uh, there, there's lamarckian evolution before darwin 50 years before darwin and darwin was well aware of that there was a theory of evolution by uh, someone called jean baptiste lamarck and he was an important biologist, he had many important contributions, but, the one, but he was wrong about the mechanism. The right mechanism of evolution is natural selection. And there are endless proofs of that, and that's certainly true. But what Lamarck said is that acquired traits are inherited. This is how we evolve. So the famous example is the, the, the neck of the giraffe. Mm -hmm. According to Darwin, um, when the giraffes were in the... Darwin now, the, when the giraffes in the savannah had to eat, the few that were a little different because they had a mutation in their DNA. Dar David didn't know anything about DNA or mutations. Okay, so he didn't know the mechanism also. But the, there were a few giraffes that were slightly different. The other died and they got to pass the genetic materials to the next generation. So they survived. They were selected by, uh, uh, by natural selection. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's a true mechanism. And slowly the next got longer. Right, and, and since, since they passed their genes to the next generation, they took over, their genes took over the population, okay? Okay. According to Lamarck, and that was before, um, the giraffes used some internal force to extend their neck towards the trees. Mm. And this change that they acquired during their life transmitted to the next generation, okay? Since we don't have a mechanism for extending limbs at will, this was always considered to be a total joke. Darwin, by the way, believed it, okay? So he was a Lamarckist himself, but uh, later in his career, because he didn't know genetics. But, uh, but it was considered to be completely wrong and it was abused, this theory, just like Darwinism was abused by Nazis and so on. Also, Lamarckism was abused, especially in, in, uh, in uh, the Soviet Union. It, was, it fitted their ideology mm -hmm. and, they, uh, and, they, uh, and they really did horrible things with it. And now? And now there's a, um, a renaissance of, uh, of epigenetic inheritance and it's not Lamarckism because Lamarck was wrong for other reasons didn't know how genetics work. The te theory was teleological, as if you know what, what, what's about to happen. But there is now proof that there is epigenetic inheritance, inheritance that doesn't work through DNA, and that it allows, in certain cases, at least in nematodes, at least in these simple worms, also acquired or, or transmission of parental responses. We, uh, and this changes the way we think about the limits of, of, of inheritance and so what's I, possible. I'm still kind of confused about what, what exactly Lamarck was, was proposing, that the, the giraffe extends his neck or like... Stretches like, it until it's... 
or or just like i don't know stretches like i stretch my arms no, stretch, because it changes over... itself it changes itself during its lifetime and that's possible i mean you can you can yeah. you can grow you can you can build up muscle if you go to the gym yeah. but your kids won't be stronger as a result right yeah his theory said that if you if you build up muscle in the gym you you change yourself your kids would be stronger right oh, and that's obviously not the case but that's a particular case where it doesn't happen there could be other instances where things do transmit mm-hmm I so see. where does it meet the squirrels? So it doesn't meet the squirrels. The oh. squirrels is something completely different. <laughs> okay. I think this is something that uh, the people at uh, Eric Schmidt's uh, foundation and the, uh, uh, the polymath award, they liked. Because uh, the squirrels and other, other things we did, we studied irrationality, as you mentioned, I can also talk about that, but that is totally different. And I think they like the fact that we do different things. So tell us about the squirrels. So, yeah, so the squirrels is actually classic genetics. Okay. And I will tell you a little bit about this. The, the Dead Sea Squirrels were found in the desert in the 40s and 50s in Israel. Mm-hmm. And that was a shock because they were found by a Bedouin shepherd by accident. Uh, and uh, he wandered into a cave because he lost a goat. And when, when he went inside, he found uh, many vessels that contain these ancient scrolls it's like moses all over again <laughs> right and, and these scrolls are they, they they found tons of scrolls they found 25,000 uh, approximately 25,000 pieces of scrolls and they are amazingly um, well preserved and they contain the oldest bible the next one is hundreds of years older and also the story of this uh, these people that lived around this area who wrote the scrolls their identity is a little uh, is debated, but uh, the, 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 it reflects their lifestyle and what they believed and 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 they lived and and, and perfectly preserved from two thousand years ago ago and two thousand years ago is a critical period in the history of Judaism and also Christianity. Uh, supposedly, uh, Jesus and so on w- w- was there at the same time and so on. And um, and of the rest, and, and so we have tons of scrolls with this important archaeological uh, information, while the rest is lost. So people have been studying the scrolls for seventy years or so since they were discovered, and they are preserved in the in a museum and in the with the in, uh, Israel Antiquity Authorities in Jerusalem. The thing is that while the the people that assembled the scrolls did an amazing job, it's still really difficult because it's like trying to assemble an unknown number of puzzles with an unknown number of pieces where mm-hmm. many of them are also missing or, or degraded or you can't read them. Mm-hmm. So they did a, a fantastic work of assembling them. By many cases, they have um, uncertainties. as they, they don't know if a particular piece fits with this piece or that piece. And the weather of, and, and how you, you connect them changes the meaning of the text and the whole history. Mm-hmm. So they use every, every clue that they could. In certain cases, it's easier. So, for example, if it's the Bible, you know the Bible also from other sources, it helps you. But if it's a completely new story, so it, it's much harder. And to complicate things uh, even further, they were discovered by, um, uh, by people who then uh, sold them to the research authority. So many people tried to fake them or to claim that were, they were found in this case, where in fact they were found in other places. So it's really difficult. They did an amazing job, but still they have uncertainties. And what we did is we took scrolls, ancient scrolls, 2,000 year old scrolls, and we used the fact that the scrolls are written on parchment. It's made from animal skins. Mm. Right? And we sequence the ancient DNA of the animals. So we can say we look at a particular scroll and we isolate the ancient DNA. And then we say this is a, it's a particular ship. It should fit with another ship f- with the same... If, if another skull is made from the same ship, they fit together. And if another skull is made from a different ship, they don't fit together. All of a sudden, it gives another parameter. Right. And, uh, or if it's made from a goat or a, a cow, then it doesn't fit together. You can't say, though, that this is like, you know, uh, Polly the sheep or Fred. We, we really don't know if it's Polly, but we can say how closely related it is. Okay. So we can say whether... It, so even when, when there are... Uh, pieces that are made from two sheep. You could say these are we different can say sheep. these are different sheep and they are more or less closely related. So wow. we also sampled uh, uh, um, scrolls from other places around the the, Judea, uh, the, the Dead Sea, uh, from Masada, Nachal Hever, Nachal Selim, other places, and we can see from where uh, they came. Mm-hmm. 
and um, and this is really by the way we can't just chop uh, just you know grind the, the scrolls right because they are priceless so we can't even touch them the people that work in conserving them they scrape off just a little bit of scroll dust from the uninscribed side of the scroll and this is what we sequence in astronaut suits in clean rooms and wow. then and, and when you do this you find that in certain cases 90 percent of the dna comes from humans that contaminated them in antiquity and also in modernity Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the pictures uh, in the museum, you see that people there, they, they used to work without gloves and they smoked while they worked with the scrolls and so on. <laughs> so um, so it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge, also technological I think challenge. Moshe Dayan saved some of the scrolls, right? He bought it from there. It's a crazy story, guys. Th there are, there are many crazy yeah. stories. DNA is Moshe right. Dayan's. But, but the interesting thing here <laughs> is, that, is that we did with, um, we had many collaborators, so it's not just us. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't know anything about the scroll, but we collaborated with the, the, the important collaborator, the collaborator w that we worked with is Noam Mizrahi, who's a biblical scholar who gave us the context mm -hmm. and told us how this changes the interpretation of the, the, the text and, and the history of the scroll. So you managed mm -hmm. to reassemble pieces. We managed to, uh, uh, to confirm and to exclude some connections, mm -hmm. which changes some of the, the stories uh, in our understanding of the, their history. So which gives them a lot, a lot higher confidence in piecing together certain parts. Uh, yes. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. And that's the, the project. Sci-fi. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. a project that was uh, funded by, by Eric Schmidt. And that, that's, it, it also happened totally by accident. So the whole thing, how did I start working on this course? Just when I started in the university, my appointment, I said there was a retreat for new faculty. And on the bus, on the way to eating uh, Druzi and Pita, I sat next to Noam. This biblical scholar, which just who just started uh, um, his appointment in the university, and then we started talking. We had 20 minutes or something until we got there. So we started talking, and each of us told the other what um, he studies, and then we thought about this connection. We started working on it, and it took us seven or eight years to finish. So that was a long project. On that bus, though. On the bus, we stayed for eight years. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> on the yeah. bus, yeah, though, the idea was concocted. Yeah, that, the, exactly. And then I started just using, you know, some startup money that I had to, for my lab. I didn't have a dedicated fund. But then there was a visit in the University of Eric Schmidt, and the university arranged for me to w go to... Was the CEO of Google? It was the CEO of Google, yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, one of the um, most influential people in high tech. And, mm -hmm. and then uh, we went for a dinner. I went to dinner with him, and uh, we told him about the idea, and he said, this is the best idea I've ever had. <laughs> and two weeks later, we had the money in the, in the university bank, to do this, we normally you write a grant, you wait a year. That's this so was cool. super fast. So Amazing. cool. And uh, before we talk a bit about the future, tell us a bit about the irrationality. Because we, we, we guys, if you don't know, we did an, a podcast for eToro, a uh, high tech company. It's called uh, Economize Me. Mm -hmm. And we interviewed, we actually dealt with that subject. We interviewed uh, some very profound uh, people on, mm -hmm. this, on this subject. So it's, cool. it's extremely interesting. It's close to heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was another uh, another thing actually that was born in this retreat. So in the same retreat, not on a bus, but I met uh, Dino Levy, who's a, a neuroscientist, but he works on neuroeconomics. He's also from Tel Aviv University. We started talking about what we can do. And as you know, since you, you study this, that um, it has been shown, and this uh, started with the work of uh, Kahneman and Tversky, that people behave irrationally mm -hmm. in an economic sense. So we don't maximize the value of our decisions. We're inconsistent. Uh, and there are different explanations to this, to why, but the, the explanations are from the realm of psychology. Mm -hmm. You say that there's a slow system in the brain, a fast system, or we use uh, uh, heuristics, or we do it because of emotions, or regret, or all, kind, all kinds of things like that. But how does the biology, wh what's in the biology that does this? How does our brain produce this irrationality? Since the brain is so complicated, because our brains has billions of neurons connected by many billions of synapses, connections, it's really hard to study. Again comes the worm. This simple nematode that we studied also for the epigenetic is called C. elegans. It's a very important model organism for biology. And the worm has only 302 neurons, brain cells. And it's always 302. And they are wired exactly the same between worms. And every, every worm neuron has a name. I, I had to be a worm. <laughs> yeah. There are many advantages. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean the worm, I mean, they are, they are the real rulers of the world. Four <laughs> out of five animals 
in this world are worms. Wow. Uh, Four out of five animals in this world are worms. Yes. Not ants. No, you're talking about there are, there are different... No, if you're talking about beetles, there are many species of beetles. Okay? But the most common animal is the worm. Wow. Um, so worms are... So always people ask me, what's the relevance to humans? And, and I hope there is, but, but it's also relevant to worms. And they affect, you know, uh, exchange of gases with the atmosphere and, and they eat bacteria and fungi and uh, everything. So they affect the, 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 the planet. Mm -hmm. If you take off the worms, the planet will, you know, fall. But um, so they, they have only 302 neurons. And we know how they are wired. We have a map of their connections. It's like a subway map. And each neuron has a name. And we can activate neurons and turn them off in uh, different ways. Like, for example, using light. You can turn neurons on and off using light. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to study whether worms using... B b also in their primitive, simple nervous system, this simple brain, behave irrationally. How do you study irrationality in nematodes? So you make them choose between different things. So we let the worms... Uh, most of what the worms do is they smell things. And they move towards the smell, hoping there's food. Or they run away, fearing that it's a predator or something. Sounds or it's more a or less the way I make decisions. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure it is. I mean, I think at the end it's fundamental. Also, many of the things that we know about human neurons were discovered in worms. Okay, well. So these worms, are they, you probably never heard of them before, but just since the year 2000, six Nobel Prizes were awarded to people who studied worms. These it, aren't like the earthworms that I would play with no. as a kid. We no, no, up. these are much smaller. They are microscopic worms you uh, can't see with, your, with the naked eye. Okay. Just a random thought I'm having is they are so simple, right? And we understand how their mind works so well, and yet we cannot create such an organism from scratch. No, and we don't fully understand them yet. So that's another, you know, a, a moment of modesty for the neuroscience community. People try to understand the brain, but we don't understand the simple nervous system, which is genetically identical, which is wired the same way. Although it's 302 neurons, we still don't, don't understand it. We know some, we know it's much better than any other nervous system, but we don't understand it fully. We, we are not close to that. So it's wow, a huge it's challenge. Crazy. Right? Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, using these worms, we can study rational decision making. We'll make the worms choose between two different Odos, okay, that they like, and two, two smells, ah, okay, two yeah. smells, two two smells, and 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 we 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 track them, we watch them as they move towards this order and not that odo, and we establish the fact that they prefer odo A over odo B, okay, okay, and they are very consistent in that because it's an innate preference that they have. And now the question, uh, so, and, and now we can study how they make these preferences and whether it's it's rational or not. And one type of rationality or irrationality that was discovered also in humans, it's very famous, it's called independence of irrelevant alternatives. And you know it from your life, from your real life. And so, for example, if you, if you have to choose between two bottles of, water, of uh, wine and you prefer A over B, it's more tasty, the price is better, you prefer it. And then forget about the price, that's confusing actually. Okay, let's, let's do, forget about the wines, I'll do it with, you prefer oranges over apples. Okay, mm -hmm. you just like it better. And then it was discovered that if I add another option, let's say a pair, under certain circumstances, it can change your preference. If first you preferred oranges over apples, in the presence of a pair, you might change your preference. Now you prefer apples over oranges, but why? You like the, the, the taste of the, of the orange better. Why did you change it just because there's a pair? And people use this against us. For example, in we like new things. Not only new, but also in, in, in menus of restaurants. They put mm -hmm. something very expensive or very cheap to change your, the way that you choose. And empirically, it works. Mm -hmm. And this is very established. But how? Why? Why does it work? And again, there are all these uh, psychological... Like, uh, I think there's a great example of if you have two options for, uh, for uh, membership programs, right? And you have like A and B and A is the cheapest and B is slightly more expensive. Most people will pick A, but if you add one more that's a little bit more expensive than B, people will choose the middle option. Right. The, 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 it's the, like, what's wrong with the cheap one? Right. right? And the question is why? Yeah. Uh, so in worms, we can actually study this. And what we did is we let the worms choose between order A and order B. And we established they prefer in a certain concentration of the order A over B. But we found that in certain cases, if you add C, they switch their preference. They be mm -hmm. behave irrationally. 
but we can figure out exactly why and how because we know which neurons are involved in the sensation of A, which neurons are involved in the sensation of B, and which neurons are involved in the sensation processing of the signal that comes from C. And we found that particular neuronal architectures, how you have to activate their neurons to make them behave irrationally. And we can also then engineer them genetically, so their brains will be slightly different, to make them more or less irrational. And this is what we did in this study. And this can be expre- what's the word extrapolated to extrapolated, yeah. to human. We don't know, but what I can tell you is that we found that the simple law that we identified, which I can explain, is super simple. What we found is that uh, let's say that there's a, a, a the the sensation of odor A takes up certain neurons are involved in the sensation of odor A. Certain neurons are involved in the sensation of odor B. Okay. If odor C takes up more resources from the neurons that sense odor A than it does from the neurons that sense odor B, then the worm would switch its preference. Just because there's a limited bandwidth, it's mm -hmm. like a short circuit. And now there are more resources allocated to the sensation of B, so they prefer it. Mm -hmm. and, and we could engineer it just by you know, making more resources available for the sensation of A or B, make them less or more. That's incredible. And it raises so the, just another question. If you establish, let's assume it is a neurological thing and there is this, you can pinpoint that reason. What is it about evolution that brought species to be so irrational? irrational right. So it's a great question. First of all, I would say that I, I, I don't know if it extrapolates or not, but I think that it does because the same, we did a mathematical model of how neurons fire to understand this. And the same model, that explains why we have visual, certain visual illusions, also humans, in, uh, explains why we have these irrational decisions. So it's, a, it's an illusion of, of our decision-making mm -hmm. that throws us off. And the question of why we evolve is, so we use heuristics, we use simplifications to understand the world because we need to decide fast. So it could be a trade-off bef uh, uh, between uh, the, the how fast we make the decision and how accurate we do it. it it's not necessarily a feature. It mm -hmm. could be just a bug. Mm -hmm. But it could be a feature. It could be a feature. Well, we don't know. Well, I, I believe it's a bug. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Because, I mean, it could, it, in a sense, like when you talk about irrationality, the more you talk about it, first of all, there's something misleading about the term irrationality because... The more you talk about it, the more you rationalize it and you actually make it all of a sudden make sense. And then it's not irrational all of a sudden. The thing is that is irrational is like, well, why would I base my decision on this thing that you all of a sudden makes sense, how it's working, yeah. but it doesn't make sense why the decision is being based on the fact that I have more senses devoted to one rather than the other. Right. I, I agree that the term irrationality is inconfusing. It, it, this is how they define rationality, the economist. Mm -hmm. But it's not They're how not we... scientists. Right. But, right. <laughs> but it's not how we... I mean, normal people are used to think about that. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. So what are you going to do with $2.5 million? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, we started many different things. Uh, if you had to decide right now, if I give you two options, A and B, okay? Yeah. No, I wonder, I wonder if it would have been easier if you didn't have those funds to come up with your next big thing. <laughs> No. Right? <laughs> no? Because <laughs> suddenly it's no, like... No, no, no. He's just trying to, no, to we, Jew I, you out of the yeah. 2.5. The, the thing that I will, I will do is I will try to use it for different things and see what works. Mm -hmm. So I have a few projects that we're working on. We also uh, um, had a, a project about brain parasites and how to use them to our advantage. Um, I'm starting a project about uh, music. Um, uh, the, the genetic underpinning of musical abilities um so many different things and we see what catches wow i could be a great specimen for that <laughs> um, like for your bass like zero musical I abilities mean, if I, you I, want I, one i have you know? that, that's me <laughs> yeah <laughs> perfect no rhythm no key no tone nothing um Wow, so so you have a lot of ideas, but when do you have to like do you have a timeline? Do you have to decide? Five we have, years. We have five years. That's, that's uh -huh. plenty of time. So you could spend two years just exploring you know. options. I mean, I hope to be surprised. We have something that we started, but I hope new things will also come come up. Okay. Um, wow, it leaves uh, a taste for more. Great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. 
or did there anything else like we didn't uh, talk no, no, about? No, no. We touched everything, My right? My pleasure. Thanks a lot for Thank inviting me. Thank you so me. much for coming. It's been really fascinating. Really, really fascinating, yeah. Um, you're on social media. How can people follow your work? I'm on Twitter. Okay. I'm on Twitter. Spell Odet Rechavi. Yes, R-E-C-H-A-V-I. Right, okay. you pronounce it in English, Rechavi. Uh, uh, no, just for spelling purposes. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. Yeah. Rechavi. <laughs> uh, cool. So check it out. Um, is there is there a way that like the layman can follow what you're doing? Do you feel like there's an accessible way to the research that you guys are doing? In the I, I get many popular talks. There's a TED uh, talk you can see online, mm -hmm. other talks and, uh, um, and this and this, of course, <laughs> and, and Twitter probably. Okay. So you tweet I'm, I'm out. I'm quite active. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm uh, addicted, <laughs> addicted. addicted to Twitter. Yeah. Ah, uh, really? But like, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming the papers you guys put out are not really accessible for the layman. But you're saying that when no, you, when by you many tweet, cases, they are also covered by the by the media by the media, and then. Uh, okay. But you can but recommend a, a book, maybe uh, like to our audience. Yeah, yeah a, 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 a good book about uh, epigenetics is a book that was written many years ago, but there are new editions all the time by uh, uh, Chava Yablonka. Eva Yablonka, it's called Evolution in Four Dimensions. Okay. That's cool. a great book that I recommend. It's a popular science when book. When the media cover the the research that you guys do, do, do you get like frustrated? Is it like, oh, guy, you're killing me? No, I, I think I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, a tyrant with the media. So I really try to make sure that they will be accurate. Ah, really? So I didn't have too many disappointments. Okay. I get better at that. I think also at the beginning, I get, you know, I got mails from uh, creationists and all kinds of people and but that stopped <laughs> so, it's <not> worth, <laughs> okay. so it's quite uh, quite accurate okay i see very cool so very, before very we cool. go um first of all this is sponsored by masa please check them out yes masa israel journey so check them out masa israel.org slash two nice jewish boys also uh we are sponsored by the forward so go to forward.com slash to NJB and get a you get an exclusive price. offer. You get like uh, f uh, six months for fifteen bucks. Yes. Uh, if you you if you go to uh, forward.com slash two NJB, check yes. them out. It's a great source for news, opinion, all through a Jewish lens. Also, Arutz Sheva, IsraelNationalNews.com. Check them out for the English uh, Israeli perspective about a current event. And last but not least, the Australian Jewish news, ajn.timesofisrael.com. Please check them out. Yes. Highly recommended content. And, and we do this on our free time, guys. So if you feel like throwing us, you know, one, two, 2.5 million, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can go to 2njb.com slash donate and help us out. Thank you so much for listening. Thank By the way, you, so you, much for you joining. also accept like if someone wants to invest in your research you, of course it's possible right of they course. reach sure. they can reach out to you please please do okay <laughs> <laughs> all right cool thank you so thank much you. thank you thank you Professor thank you very Ravi. much it's been a pleasure bye guys bye